are your breasts too small? Well, if they are, then I have the solutions for you on this segment. So we're gonna go ahead and get started uh, by talking about the scenarios that people have when they have breasts that are too small or smaller than they want them to be. So for some patients, uh, the breasts are too small because they just never developed. And I see a lot of those types of patients who come in, sometimes they come in uh, quite often when they're a bit on the younger side in their 20s. Uh, other times some people wait uh, until later on in life uh, to change things. Uh, there is something also called postpartum involution. And this is, what, this is what occurs after having children and especially after breastfeeding, quite commonly women find that their breasts get much smaller. Some women find that their breasts are too small because they have had uh, a lot of weight loss and the weight loss has caused their breasts to shrink down in size. Uh, other women find that they've had a breast reduction in the past and then maybe they've lost some weight causing their breasts then to be too small. Uh, finally, there, is, there are women who have breast cancer, they undergo mastectomy uh, and followed by a reconstruction. Uh, this is something that is beyond the scope of this talk and is more towards the reconstructive area. Now, I myself do not do uh, breast reconstruction for breast cancer patients anymore. Uh, so if that is something that you are looking for, uh, feel free to contact our office and we'd be happy to refer you uh, to a local plastic surgeon who does that very commonly. But these are the typical scenarios that we see. Most commonly, it's one of the first two where women say that they just really never developed the breasts that they wanted or after having children, their breasts have gotten a lot smaller. So what do you do to treat this? Uh, well, there are some non-surgical treatment options and really, really the option is one and it's called Brava. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. There's also an option called fat grafting to the breasts and there is breast augmentation with an implant, which is really the gold standard, what we do pretty much in all patients. So where do we go from this? Well, the Brava real quick is not something that I have a lot of experience with. Basically, it operates out of the, out of the um, theory of external tissue expansion. So the Brava device is the only non-surgical uh, breast enhancement device that is scientifically proven to work. It basically is two suction cups that are attached to your breasts and you wear them something like 10 hours a day for a couple of months to add about a half a cup to a cup size to your breasts. The issue with this, however, is, is it literally is like 10 hours a day, maybe more. And if you skip literally just one day, it adds like a couple of weeks to the time. So it's quite an expensive treatment because it's so onerous, because it's so difficult uh, to do this so many hours a day for so long, it's not very commonly used. Uh, but it is a non-surgical option to enhance the breasts, just not something that most women decide to undergo. Fat grafting to the breasts is something that has made quite a bit of news recently. Uh, over the last couple years, more and more plastic surgeons have actually uh, performed fat grafting to the breasts. And the way this surgery works is that you take fat from a different part of the body, typically the tummy or the hips or the thighs, in a liposuction type of fashion, then you take that fat, you purify the fat, and then inject it into the breasts. Now this is a multiple hour surgery because truly what it is, is it's combining a lot of liposuction with the actual injections of the fat. So to, to actually harvest that fat, you have to do quite a bit of liposuction and that can take several hours in and of itself. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with fat grafting to the breasts is a lot of women who want bigger breasts don't have a whole lot of fat that we can harvest. So if you're in real good shape, you know, with the amount of fat that you need, okay, so the way this works is only about half of the fat that is injected into the breast will actually stay long term. And so for you to get a, a, a significant size change, you need to remove a ton of fat to, to do that. And the vast majority of women that I see who want their breasts larger uh, don't have nearly enough fat to harvest for it. But if you do, then basically what you need to look at is a liposuction type of a surgery with the added step of injecting the fat to the breasts. That surgery can take multiple hours. Uh, recovery can take upwards of a couple of weeks, depending on just how much liposuction you have done. Um, you will have obviously multiple scars from where the liposuction is, uh, is performed to harvest the fat and then the small scars on the breast to actually inject it. 
Now, what are the, what's the recovery of fat grafting to the breast? Uh, recovery itself usually is not that difficult. Uh, you probably have some discomfort from the liposuction. Um, and once again, depends on how much liposuction is performed, the breasts themselves probably have very little pain at all. Now, initially, you may look at your breasts after fat grafting and say, wow, this looks really good. You know, they're quite a bit larger. But then what's going to happen is you'll lose a combination of swelling and some of that fat. And once again, on average, maybe 50% or less of that fat will stick around. As the swelling and the, uh, de decreases and the fat gets reabsorbed, most of the time people get about one cup or less enhancement with this procedure. Because of that, um, the results overall and how much it enhances your breasts are usually fairly modest. This is not something that you can go from an A to a C or from a B to a D cup. Uh, this is more, like I said, about a half a cup to a cup size. The main reason why this is not something that I recommend in most patients is because of the concern for possible mammographic alterations, meaning that injecting fat into the breast may create calcifications that could uh, be mistaken for even possible dangerous calcifications that you can see with breast cancer. So you do need to, if you do fat graft from the breast, you need to make sure that you get your mammograms as normal and keep in mind that there is a possibility that your mammograms may look quite unusual due to all the fat grafting. Um, now, the people who do a lot of fat grafting the, to the breast will tell you that GERD radiologists can tell the difference between harmless calcifications from fat grafting versus dangerous calcifications from breast cancer. Um, there have been studies that appear to confirm this as well as my understanding, but I'm still a bit skeptical. And because of that, I do not perform fat grafting to the breast on a routine uh, nature. I usually use that in just a salvage type procedure. The other thing that I'm a little concerned about, it's more of a theoretical risk, is stem cells. And what we have found in the last several years is that our fat is chock full of stem cells. Well, we do know that the breasts uh, are a cancer-prone organ. One in nine women will get breast cancer in their lifetime. So how is it? Uh, how do we know that injecting fat, which is chock full of stem cells, won't potentially increase the risk of breast cancer? Or what if you have a breast cancer that's kind of quiet and sitting in your breast that you may have had for several years, and, and it's so tiny that you don't even know you have it, it's not dangerous at this time, but how do we know that injecting stem cell rich fat around, potentially around that breast cancer that you don't know about may not cause that breast cancer to start getting bigger because of those stem cells. So these are things that I feel myself need to be proven that fat grafting won't alter the mammograms and more and more we're finding that, 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 that uh, the changes in mammograms radiologists can determine are due to fat grafting versus cancer. But even more important, we want to make sure, or just as important, we want to make sure that the stem cells in that fat do not alter the risk of breast cancer, or they do not worsen the prognosis, or they do not cause a potential um, unknown breast cancer, let's say, to grow much faster. Okay, and that's those are the reasons why, for me, even though fat grafting, for a lot of patients, they say, hey, it makes sense, I can use my own tissues, uh, you know, I could just, hey, I, and I can lose maybe my saddlebags, we can put it in my breasts. Yeah, theoretically, that is a good idea, but in reality, is it truly the safest, best way to do it? Uh, so in my practice, if you're considering fat grafting to your breasts, I do typically save that for those situations where implants just are not an option. So if you've had breast implants and you have not been able to tolerate them, um, if, you've have, if you have issues where you can't use breast implants, then that's where I have used fat grafting to the breast in the past and have had fairly reasonable results with it. You know, it's never really um, dramatic in the size you can get, but you can get a fairly decent improvement with the fat grafting. So I hope that clears up for you, fat grafting to the breast. Let me show you a picture here. This is a before and after of a patient who came to see me. Now, the before picture, she had had a breast reduction by a different surgeon and had it paid for by insurance, and they removed so much tissue from her breasts that her breasts were too small. Now, the way the breast reduction worked is she had good volume in the center of her breast, but out in the sides is where she lacked it. 
And so just putting an implant in her wouldn't have worked very well because it would have made her breasts larger, but it still would have kept that odd shape where she was real full in the center of her breast, but on the sides, she was quite hollow. So for her, we talked a lot about her options and what we ended up doing is taking fat. And you can see she's not a tiny, tiny person. So we took fat from her tummy, from her hips, kind of helped to contour in, which she loved, and took that fat and injected it into the sides and the uh, basically the sides of each breast. And that helped to fill the breasts out to make them look a bit rounder and fuller and more naturally full compared to what she had before. So this is a situation where implants wouldn't have worked for her. They would have made things overall fuller, but would have still kept some of her um, odd shape to the actual breasts. So fat grafting made a lot uh, of sense for her. And here's another picture you can see from the side that she had her breasts were a bit unusually shaped and the implants would not have helped that and hence the fat grafting really worked well. And once again, you can see with her waist there, if you look closely, her waist has cinched in a bit, she looks thinner and that was the other thing that she was hoping to achieve. And so for some patients, fat grafting to the breasts I think can be worth the potential risks but in the vast majority of patients, I'd say 98% of patients who come in for breast enhancement, implants are really the way to go. So let's talk about breast augmentation with implants. This is probably the most common operation that I do in my practice. I probably average anywhere from 100 to 150 breast augmentation surgeries a year. So if you're thinking about breast implants, there are four major decisions you need to make. And those decisions are, you need to determine what size you wanna be, whether you want a silicone or saline type of an implant, where the scar goes on or near your breast, and whether the implant goes above or under the muscle. Okay, By looking at these four decisions for you to make regarding your breast implants, you can hopefully help point the surgery in the right direction for you. There's so many options that we have with breast augmentation surgery. I'll go over them here over the next you know, 20 minutes or so, uh, but there's so many options that you have uh, that there, that by choosing all these different things, you can hopefully point the surgery in the direction that you want to go to get the result you're looking for. Because everybody wants something a little bit different. Some people want breasts that are really large and they look round and fake. Yes, believe it or not, people ask for fake looking breasts sometimes. Uh, other people say that they just want a small change, a modest change that other people may not notice. And still other people say they want kind of a moderate change. They want to go from an A to a C. Uh, so you may be anywhere in that vicinity, but by making these four decisions, we can hopefully get that surgery pointed in the right direction for you. So the first thing let's talk about is size. Now everybody comes in with different sizes. They can be a double A, which is extremely, uh, which is quite small and, and fairly flat. They can be an A, which is quite common. They could be a B, and this is an augmented B, a C, uh, and some patients even want to be a D, and this is a post-op patient. So everybody wants a different size, everybody has a different size starting out with, how do you determine what size that of implant to choose? Well, implants don't come in A, B, and C cup sizes, okay? They come in milliliters or cc's, that's the same thing. And so we can't, if you say, hey, I wanna be an A, give me an A cup implant, it doesn't work out that way. Or I wanna be a D, give me an implant that's a, that's a D cup in size. It doesn't work out that way. So the best way to decide what size you wanna be and what CCs, basically how many CCs of an implant you wanna be, is to start at home. And there is something called the RICE test, okay? Uh, this is something that you can do at home. Basically what you do is you take a nylon stocking and then you take a measured amount of rice. And just for example, a very average size breast implant is 350 cc's or milliliters. Take 350 cc's of rice, pour it into that nylon stocking, okay? Uh, flatten that nylon stocking out and then tie off and cut off the top, okay? So it's basically like a discus, like the shape of a, of a breast implant. Do two of those the same size and then put on a very sheer broad, not one that's padded. Then take those those kind of, uh, 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 those rice, uh, the um, nylons filled with rice that are kind of those flat discus shaped um, balls of rice basically, and put them in the front of your bra. And then massage it to try to get it to, to conform to the shape of your breast. 
that's going to be a great way for you to determine what is a good size breast implant for you. And I encourage you, put those those uh, um, discus type shapes of, of rice in the nylons in your bra and walk around with it. Stay at home with it for a couple hours. Get used to that size and make sure that's the size that you want. In the office, we do something very similar, but instead of using rice, we have uh, pre-measured silicone gel sizer implants. So we have sizer implants ranging from 200 cc's up to 700 cc's, I think, in our office, and everything in between. And so what we'll do in the office during a face-to-face consultation, if we have enough time, is we'll put a bra on you, put the sizer implants in the bra, have you stand in front of a three-way mirror, and really get a good idea of how that would look on you. Okay, but you can do that at home as well, like I said, doing the rice test. And um, I did do the, I did actually um, show the rice test on a recent segment of the Rachel Ray Show. So take a peek at our YouTube page uh, under National Entertainment for Rachel Ray, and you should be able to find uh, the video for when I performed the rice test on her show. Now, another way that you can determine size, and this is something we would do in the office after, uh, in, a, in a separate visit, after you come in for a face-to-face consultation. So it's not done at your face-to-face consultation, but it's done after that, is the Axis 3D. So one of the things that's real hot in the field of plastic surgery now are 3D morphing to get an idea of how you might look after surgery. And we have at YPS a state-of-the-art 3D imaging device where you stand in front uh, and it's multiple cameras, they take a picture of your torso, and then we can put it on the screen and put in virtual implants to get an idea of how that would look. Now, it's very helpful for those people who say, look, I just wanna make sure that I don't look ridiculous and that the size that I've already chosen looks good on me. It can work really well for that. It also helps to see asymmetries. If one breast is a little bit bigger than the other, the Axis 3D can really help you to actually see it because it's right there on the screen. But typically, I always start off in the face-to-face consultation by using the sizer implants in the bra, and then once again at home, you can definitely do the rice test, which will get you ahead of the game. All right, so after deciding what um, size that you want, now you gotta think about what type of implant you want. And there are multiple types of implants on the market today. Let's start off with the traditional saline implants. The traditional saline implants and and each type of implant has its own pros and cons. There's good and there's bad with each type of breast implant and that's why not one implant is the best for everybody. When you look at a traditional saline implant, the benefit of a saline implant is that it's very simple. It's just a a silicone rubber bag filled with salt water. Uh, Because of that, it's a bit less expensive. Uh, $1,000 per pair at this time is what we charge for it. Uh, And that's just for the implants, that's not for the whole surgery. Because they're just filled with sterile salt water, uh, nobody would argue that they're very safe. Uh, If they break, it's easy to clean them up. It's just salt water, so your body absorbs it, no big deal. Well, the negatives of saline, though, is that they don't look or feel as natural as silicone. And what people really don't like about saline are the wrinkles and the ripples that you can see and feel at times with these types of implants. So saline implants have a higher risk of wrinkling and rippling versus silicone. So because of that, the traditional saline implants have really fallen out of favor. Uh, I almost never put these implants in anymore, although they are still an option for those people who want to go that way. So what are people using? Well, people now are using the silicone implants. Silicone implants look and feel more natural, and they're the most natural implants that we have ever really had. But they are more expensive, and there are some concerns about how you monitor these implants. So I mentioned earlier that if you have a saline implant and that saline implant breaks, it's very easy to know it's broken. You look down at your breast one day, you go, oh, my implant deflated, okay? With silicone, it may be harder to tell, okay? So if you've got a broken implant, sometimes, but not always, but sometimes the implant, the breast and implant will change shape. And you'll say, well, geez, my left breast feels nice and firm and round, and my right breast, it just feels odd. It doesn't have that shape, the roundness that that it used to have. That's a sign potentially of a break. Other times, another sign of a break is scar tissue. Sometimes you can feel a little knot of scar tissue develop if some of the silicone protrudes out. Sometimes the inner silicone gel that's inside the silicone implants is more reactive than the outer silicone rubber. And so if an implant breaks and that inner silicone um, filling 
contacts the breast tissue, then that can create inflammation and scar tissue in some patients. So sometimes you can feel it, and you can feel scar tissue develop around the implant. But there are other times that you may have a break and have absolutely no idea. Okay, the breast doesn't change much shape at all. Uh, you don't develop scar tissue. It looks and feels fine, but believe it or not, it's still broken. And because of this, the FDA does recommend an MRI three years after surgery and then every other year thereafter. Okay, and this is what the FDA has recommended uh, for patients who have silicone gel filled implants. Um, this is not something that I see many of my patients doing, unfortunately, because this is a completely optional um, thing. You don't have to do it. And the unfortunate case is that most insurance, the health insurances won't cover it. So MRIs can be quite expensive. But it is important to realize that that is what the FDA recommends for their silicone implant patients. Um, and so that's why I'm making that recommendation for you today. Now, to be on label, you do need to be 22 years of age or older. That's if you're on label. There are some doctors, however, and it is, I believe, a reasonable option to consider going off label for people who are under 22. You can put silicone implants for people who are under 22. It's just not considered an on label indication. And that decision is made at the discretion of the patient and the doctor. For your knowledge, I do not perform breast augmentation on anybody under 18. So if you are watching this and you are under 18, I'm sorry, but I will not perform a breast augmentation on you. Uh, you need to wait till you're at least 18. That's just my own kind of ethical thing. Um, once again, you can put in implants, silicone implants off-label on people who are under 22. One concern with going off-label is it's possible that your implant warranty may be canceled if it's not an FDA-approved indication. So you want to keep that in mind if you are under 22 and you want silicone implants. So what is the whole controversy with silicone implants? Now, this is something that has been around for a long time. There's tons of articles about it, but let me just kind of simplify it for you today. The old style silicone implants, the ones we used in the 70s, 80s, and, and early 90s, contained a liquid silicone. That silicone, literally, if you broke the implant, that silicone liquid would come oozing out, okay? And there were people who believed that that liquid silicone was coursing through people's bodies, causing various autoimmune diseases like lupus, like arthritis, uh, even um, not autoimmune disease like cancer, like breast cancer. So there were all these people back then who were really scared that these liquid silicone implants were causing various health problems. Um, because of that fear, the FDA banned the use of silicone gel implants in 1992, allowing them only to be used in an FDA cleared study. Okay, so there's still some people getting silicone implants after 1992, but in order to get them, they need to be part of the um, FDA study. Well, the FDA had banned the implants all the way up until 2006 because of this concern between the connection between autoimmune diseases and breast implants. But the studies did not support this connection. Okay, there are no large scale studies that show any obvious, any provable connection between silicone gel or saline implants and autoimmune diseases, okay? And that is why finally, in 2006, the FDA lifted the ban on silicone implants and allowed them to be used once again, okay? So let me repeat that. The fear of breast implants causing autoimmune diseases and breast cancer, uh, that has never been proven. And if anything, the studies have disproven any connection there. Uh, and because of that, the, uh, the FDA lifted the ban in 2006, and we have had access to silicone gel-filled implants ever since then. Well, it's important to realize now that the implants are much improved, okay? They're not like the old implants, and there have been uh, several um, generations of implants from the beginning, uh, and the newer generation of implants much better than the older ones. The outer shell is much stronger, so the rupture rate for silicone, silicone implants is much lower than it used to be. And the silicone inside the silicone implant is now a cohesive gel. It's not a liquid, it's a gel that sticks together. So as you can see in that picture above, if you cut an implant in half, it doesn't leak out anymore, okay? And so this is a huge improvement over the liquid silicone implants for when they would break, they would literally just ooze out and create this huge mess. The newer silicone implants, albeit not solid, are a gel uh, and they don't ooze out like they used to. 
Well, what about the gummy bear implants? You may have heard of the quote unquote gummy bear implants. Well, in the gummy bear implants, these are the newest generation of silicone gel implants. And in these implants, the silicone is more cohesive. It's thicker. It's almost like a solid in some of these implants. And because of that, there is a very low, low risk of leakage of silicone and the implants keep their shape over time. But you do need a larger scar or a larger incision needed to put it into the breast and it does feel quite a bit firmer than the other implants. And in my opinion, these gummy bear implants feel so firm that I do not recommend using them in general cosmetic situations anymore. There are a handful of patients who request them and I'm happy to use them if you really want them, but I'm finding after using them for the last few years that uh, most of my patients prefer the look and the feel of the smooth silicone implants, not the textured anatomic gummy bear implants. And we'll talk more about this in a face-to-face -face consultation should you decide uh, to proceed with the possible breast augmentation. But suffice it to say, I'm not routinely using the gummy bear implants on um, breast augmentation cosmetic patients uh, because I don't believe that most patients um, like this type of a result where it's a bit firmer, the implants don't move as much versus the smooth implants that are softer, more mobile, in my opinion, more natural looking and feeling. Well, what about the ideal implant? The ideal implant is the newest implant on the market. Okay, and this is a saline filled breast implant that has internal shells that make it look and feel more natural. So instead of the salt water, and this is a saline implant, so salt water filled implant, instead of it just being enclosed in one implant shell, like the traditional saline implants, it's enclosed in a couple of shells, allowing that saline to distribute more evenly around the implant. And because of that, the, the ideal implant looks and feels more natural than the traditional saline implant. And so if you're thinking about saline, you don't wanna go with silicone, then I would encourage you to consider the ideal implant. And those patients of mine who are not getting silicone implants, almost all of them are now going with the ideal implant. But I'll tell you, after putting a lot of these in, that the ideal implant does not look and feel quite as natural as the silicone implant. Okay, so even though it's definitely better than the traditional saline, I don't think it's quite up to what we can get with the silicone. Now, it is very important to realize that breast implants are not permanent devices. So if you undergo breast augmentation, you're going to need to have future surgery down the line, at least within the next 15 to 20 years. Now, the implants do have a 10-year warranty. If the implants break within the first 10 years, the company will help pay to replace them, uh, and they will help uh, they will give you a free pair of implants and help pay to replace them, typically. Um, at this time, if it's a silicone implant that breaks, you get upwards of $3,500 during the first 10 years and replacement of one or both implants. With saline, you don't get quite as much. It's close to $1,200 to help pay for your costs along with the implant. So keep in mind that these implants are made to last at a minimum of 10 years. But the whole idea that you have to switch them out every 10 years is completely false. And the way I describe it to patients, it's like if you buy a new car and your new car has a 50,000 mile warranty. When you hit 50,000 miles, you don't have to drive it in and turn it in because it's going to go longer than that. Okay. But, you know, once you hit 100 to 120,000 miles, maybe a little bit more, then you say, hey, look, you know, the car's still running fine, but I know it's getting older. I don't want to, I don't want this car to break down the side of the road. So I'm going to go ahead and, and pull it into the shop and sell it and get me a new car before problems start happening with this. Well, ideally, I encourage you to look at breast implants the same way, okay? They have a 10-year warranty, which means they should last you a minimum of 10 years. If not, the company will help pay to replace them. But you can't expect, but, but you should get more than that, okay? Like a car warranty, you should be able to get more. But once you hit that 15 to 20 years, we do know that with time, the implants do gradually, that shell gets weaker and weaker, and your risk of breaking goes up. Once you're around that 15 to 20 years at this time, that's what I would recommend is switch them out because it's much easier to replace an implant that's not broken yet versus replace one that has already broken. Okay, so let me repeat that. It's a lot easier to switch up an implant that's not broken for a new one versus waiting for one to break and then dealing with those consequences. Okay, so I hope this clears up the whole 10 year switch out of the breast implants for you. You don't have to do that. The warranty is for 10 years, and hopefully your implants will last you much longer than that.
Now, one question I get all the time is, what do I choose, smooth or textured implants? Well, I feel very strongly about this, and in my practice, we do prefer smooth implants over textured. Smooth implants feel softer and more natural than textured implants. They move more naturally. They're made to actually move around in the pocket inside the breast. And most importantly, they pass the hug test. If you hug somebody and you've got a smooth implant that is healed without complication, then most likely that person you hug may not have any idea that you have a breast implant. Well, this is different than textured. I don't prefer textured implants. Textured implants are firmer and they're made to stick to the surrounding tissue so they don't move as much. On top of that, recently, there has been a concern with the connection between textured breast implants and a very, very rare type of cancer called ALCL, okay? Um, this is something that is very important for you to know about and we'll talk in a face-to-face -face consultation all about this or in the preoperative visit. But suffice it to say uh, that ALCL is, uh, is a new type of cancer um, that occurs in the scar tissue around the breast implants. Typically this occurs, all the cases that we know about at this time, uh, typically all, or all of them that we know about have had some connection with a textured breast implant. Uh, we're still getting to the etiology and the causes and the treatments at this time, um, but because of this, just one more for me, nailing that textured implant coffin, uh, I recommend typically going with a smooth walled implant. Okay, now if you're interested in learning more about the ALCL, uh, there is a video here on the pre-consultation and also on my YouTube page all about breast implants and ALCL. And I strongly encourage you to watch it because it really is going to give you a lot of background information and up-to-date information on that. Um, so just for your knowledge, that's why I would go with a smooth versus a textured implant in the vast majority of my breast augmentation patients. Well, what about profile? So implants come in different shapes. The smooth walled implants come in profiles, which different profiles, which show basically how round an implant is. So you have an ultra high profile, which is the roundest implant that looks almost like a beach ball. One step below that is a high profile, then the moderate plus, the moderate and the low profile. The low profile is kind of more of that discus flatter shape, okay? The vast majority of patients, I'd say probably about 70% of patients um, undergo a breast augmentation in my practice using a moderate plus profile implant. About 30% go with the high profile implant and extremely rarely will I use one of the other ones. So the vast majority of time, it's either moderate plus, I'd say about 70% of patients and then about 30% would go with a high profile. So how do you choose the profile? Well, that's something that I encourage you not to spend a whole lot of time worrying about, okay? In the office, we do the testing for what size you want, and then I'll take your measurements and I'll fit the profile of the implant that fits your body to the size that you want, okay? So for example, if your chest, if your breast is 12 centimeters wide and you choose a 300 cc implant, okay? Um, a 300 cc implant is approximately in moderate plus profile about 12 centimeters wide. A high profile 300 cc implant may be 11 centimeters wide. Well, it would make sense if, you're, if your breast diameter, the width is 12 centimeters and you want 300 cc's and let's use a 12 centimeter 300 cc implant, not the 11 centimeters high profile implant. So we'll go with the moderate plus in that situation. So that's kind of how profiles work. In, in general, I, do, I encourage you not to worry about profile unless you want a really round breast, then definitely let me know because then we want, may want to switch the profile to something that uh, is not what I would routinely use. Okay, so for the vast majority of patients, really my default is always to use the profile that fits your body the best and that looks most natural. If you don't want that, if you want a profile that looks unnatural, definitely let me know because then we may want to deviate from what I typically will do for the vast majority of patients. Well, how about the scar? Okay, so once again, we talked about there are these different choices, the type of implant we've finished. Now let's talk about where the scar goes. The most common way that I do it and the most common way it's done across the country is with the scar underneath the breast. We call it an inframammary scar. Uh, about 80% of women across the country have it done this way. And in my opinion, this has the quickest recovery and more and more studies are showing that utilizing this approach has the lowest risk of complications. 
okay? So if you're thinking about breast implants, this is what I typically recommend for you. There is another option that I do, but not as commonly anymore, and that's a scar around the areola. It's called the periareolar approach. This scar is usually well hidden, and it lies right along that border of the areola and your skin. But more and more studies are showing that the risk of complications is higher with this approach than with the scar underneath the breast. And we think it's because of its location right next to the nipple. Uh, and the fact that we do worry about bacteria coming out of the nipple from the breast ducts and getting onto the implant. And so what I typically do during a breast augmentation is I'll use what, call, what we call a nipple shield. We'll put actually some um, uh, sterile tape over your nipples to prevent any discharge from the nipple from getting onto the breast implant. And I typically use, in most patients, the scar underneath the breast. So this is my go-to, unless for some reason you wanna go with this, then I'm happy to do that for you. I would just wanna let you know that the risks are a bit higher with this approach. And then do we put the implants above or under the muscle? Well, there are positives and negatives for going uh, above or under. So let's start with under the muscle, or technically it's a dual plane um, placement. The main benefit of going under the muscle is that there is a lower risk of complications. And the main complication we worry about is called capsular contracture. Now, capsular contracture is basically excess scar tissue that can build up around a breast implant. So anytime you put a breast implant in a patient, uh, the body will automatically create scar tissue around that implant. In about 96 to 98% of cases, that scar tissue is so soft that the breast feels and looks natural afterwards. Okay, there's, you don't even know if there's scar tissue there. But in about two to 4% of cases, the body will overreact and create too much scar tissue. That can contract around the implant, making the implant and the breast look and feel hard, firm, and even painful. That's called a capsular contracture. And if anything goes wrong with surgery, that's the most common thing that we see. Once again, about 2% of patients. If that happens, typically we do have to go back to surgery to remove that scar tissue and soften the breast back up again. Okay, so if anything goes wrong, caps or contracture, as a breast augment, as a, as a breast surgeon that does a lot of augmentations, it's one of the banes of my existence. Okay, uh, but it's not it's not a um, an illness. It's not something that's going to make you sick. It's just a pain because usually we have to go back to surgery to get you a better result, basically. Now what we find is that when the implant is placed under the muscle of the chest or in that dual plane pocket, which is what I use most of the time, the risk of capsular contracture is lower than when it's above the muscle. In addition, another positive going under the muscle or the dual plane is that the muscle will cover the top half or so of that implant. So any irregularities at the top of the breast where that muscle is, is are, that implant irregularities, those are typically camouflaged by that muscle because the muscle will kind of cover it up. And implants under the muscle typically are easier to see mammograms. So if you have a family history of breast cancer, then this may give you a bit more um, peace of mind by going under the muscle. But what are the negatives? Well, the negatives are that it's more painful and there's more swelling. So when you have a breast augmentation and they're under the muscle, it feels like your breasts are way up here and they feel rock hard. And it can take anywhere from three weeks to three months for them to soften and settle in. And that's kind of what you may have read or heard about on the internet of implants dropping or settling. And the implants will move when you flex that muscle. Because the implants are underneath the pectoralis muscle, if you flex your chest muscles, the implants can uh, move and even jiggle a little bit. So you have to kind of get used to it. There's no way around it. Well, what about going above the muscle? This is also called subglandular. Well, above the muscle, it's quicker healing and there's less pain. Okay, not bad, right? And the implant doesn't move when you flex the muscle. That's a great thing too. But what are the negatives? Well, there is a higher risk of capsular contracture, and that's a pretty big deal. There's more visibility of the implant. You see more wrinkling and more, rip and more rippling, and it's worse for mammograms. So those are some pretty big negatives. So because of that, in the vast majority of my patients, I will go under the muscle with the implants. However, in those patients who want to go above the muscle, sometimes it's because they're bodybuilders and they don't want the muscle flexion to move the implants. Other times, some people say, look, I just want something that's the easiest. Um, and then still other people may say, hey, you know, I have a friend of mine that had above the muscle and they liked it. Then we can go above the muscle. But my go-to, the, the kind of default choice usually is under the muscle because I do believe lower risk of capsular contracture, 
um, coverage with less wrinkling and rippling at the top of the breast um, and better for mammograms. Now, where the implant isn't co covered by muscle when you go under the muscle are the bottom and the sides of the breast. And that's where you may see or feel any wrinkles of the implant because you can't cover the entire implant with muscle. And that's why we call it a dual plane because dual plane meaning partially below the muscle at the top of the breast and partially above the muscle at the bottom of the breast. Now, the surgery details. The surgery for a straightforward breast augmentation takes about an hour and a half and it's a general anesthetic so you're completely asleep. Currently, as of this taping, I perform breast augmentations at Beaumont Hospital in Troy and Unisource Surgery Center. It's an outpatient surgery, so after the surgery, you go home about an hour or two later. After surgery, you're going to feel some pressure for about three to five days. It's going to feel like somebody's sitting on your chest. You may take some pain pills during that time, but most people are off the pain pills literally within 48 hours and doing great. In most of my patients, I perform what's called a rapid recovery breast augmentation, where within 48 hours, people are feeling really good and are almost back to normal. Most patients will drive within a week, and within two weeks, you should feel really good and pretty much do anything you want to do except exercising. I recommend you wait three weeks for that. And we do give you a support bra for what to wear for the first three weeks as well. So breast augmentation, once again, a rapid recovery. Typically, within 48 hours, people are, are doing great. Worst case scenario, usually within three to five days, you're doing really well. So let's take a look at some pictures. This is a patient uh, before surgery, then at two weeks, and then I'm kind of covering up above. That's her two-month post-op picture. And you can see at two weeks, things look kind of swollen. They, they look a little tight. That's very normal. They look a little high. She's under the muscle. As time goes on, they soften and they settle, and things get much better. Well, patients will ask, how will I look? And the answer is, you will look like you do now, just bigger. So if you look at this patient, she has some asymmetries. Her nipples are a little bit off. One nipple is a little bit higher than the other, and the one that's a little bit higher on that right side is a little bit off to the side. So if we make her bigger, the nipples aren't going to change. They're still going to stay that way. It's just the breasts are going to be larger. So this is really important for you to realize. And, and in a face-to-face -face consultation, I'll try to point any of these nipple asymmetries out for you. Because if you look at yourself right now and one nipple is a little bit higher than the other, implants are not going to change that. You're still going to look a little bit different. And those asymmetries that you have now may even be a little bit magnified after a breast augmentation. Now, once again, during a face-to-face -face consultation, this is something that I try to point out to you. And then people ask, will I have a space between my breasts? Very common question. Well, the answer is very simple. If you have a space between your breasts now, you'll have one after surgery. So this patient has a, a, a small to moderate space between her breasts and before surgery, and there she does, she has it afterwards. But if you don't have a space between your breasts before surgery, then you should not have one after, like you can see in this patient. So it really comes down to what I said earlier. You're going to look like you do now, just bigger, just filled out, okay? Um, so let's take a look at a couple of before and after photos, and you can see kind of that whole idea. She looks like she did before, just filled out and bigger. Uh, same thing. She looks like she did before, just filled out and larger. And the goal in general in most of my patients is to try to get them a good natural rejuvenation where people may look at and not know that they've had work done. However, if you want something a little bit different, if you don't necessarily want to look natural, let me know and we change things up in that situation, changing the profile, the size, that type of thing. And another example of a patient, uh, a little bit of a bigger size, but um, I think getting a very, very nice uh, result. So that's breast augmentation. Once again, if your breasts are too small, main option is breast implants. It's the number one surgery that I do in my practice at this time, most common because it's the most requested. Uh, it has a very, very high satisfaction rate, but this is surgery. This is a lifetime uh, type of thing that you want to consider. Okay, so I hope this has been very helpful for you. If you do decide to undergo breast augmentation, come on in for a face to face consultation. We're going to go through a lot of the same information again, uh, do an, a face to face examination, take measurements of you. You can try the sizer implants on in the office. If you do decide to have surgery, then we can do the 3D imaging uh, at a future visit. Uh, to really make sure that you get the results that you are looking for. Thank you for watching.